Roy Rasmussen will give the next talk, and uh, Roy, I don't have a stick or anything, but I'll just give you a warning, it's sitting here. Uh, fif 15 minutes, and uh, Roy is a senior scientist at NCAR, and uh, we're pleased to have him to give the next talk. I want to thank Howard um, for inviting me to this event, and he's one of my heroes, really. Um, and uh, he's a, I really echoed uh, Karen Chad's comments this morning. I thought they were spot on and you know, just a great leader, great scientist. So thank you very much, Howard, for inspiring me. Um, when I first met Howard, it was at a steering committee meeting for GWEX in Boulder, I think, with N at NCAR. And uh, I presented some of my early work that I'm going to show today. Uh, just looking at the Colorado uh, headwaters region, looking at uh, snowpack and snowfall in the Rockies. And Howard really grabbed onto that research, and he invited me to a couple more meetings, to the Climate Cold Regions uh, Network uh, workshop, and also to the GWEX Open Science meeting. And I gave more talks about our work. Um, even my NSF... Uh, monitor did not believe my initial results over the Colorado Basin, but Howard did, so thank you very much, Howard. <laughs> and so in the past, I've talked about snowfall and snowpack using what I call convective permitting. Now, convective permitting is probably not a hydrological word, but it's used in atmospheric sciences. It's uh, m running a, a high-resolution model, climate model, at resolutions that do not need a convective parameterization. So that's crucial, uh, because what we've discovered in the last 10 to 15 years of our work is that convective parameterizations don't do a very good job in capturing the uh, intensity, duration, frequency of precipitation. I'll show you some, some slides here in my talk. So today I'm going to focus on uh, convective, um, convective precipitation over the continental uh, U.S. and Canada. And as someone was mentioning earlier, to do research in today's world, I think Eric was the one who mentioned it, you need a team. Uh, I need some young people who know how to run these computers and store terabytes of data. And the simulations that I'm going to show, be showing you involve terabytes of data. And Andreas Prine, Shanghai Lu, Kyoko Aikeda, Ethan Gutman are, are just some of the members of, of the team that uh, made this research possible. So the question I'm going to address today is, dyna is dynamical downscaling and convective pr permitting scales worth it? So if we look at uh, a typical mesoscale atmospheric model, weather research and forecast model, we have to parameterize because even at, at the resolutions that say 25 kilometers or 50 kilometers, we still have to parameterize cumulus uh, convection unless we go less than four kilometers. But there's a variety of parameterizations that are included in any mesoscale model. Microphysics, cumulus, planetary boundary layer, radiation surface. We've heard a lot of discussion today about all of these. But what I want to talk about today is a little bit about across scales. So the climate models are here at Global. This is what you hear about for the CMIP-5. And then you get the NARCAP, Cortex type simulations regional, which are typically around 25 to 50 kilometers. At these scales, you need a cumulus parameterization. You just can't resolve. You have to do something with that moisture in the boundary layer. And you have to account for energy and momentum transports as well. And we typically use uh, simple microphysics. But as you get down to what we call uh, convective permitting scales, which is about four kilometers. We drop the uh, cumulus parameterization and we just use the microphysics and the resolved uh, dynamics in the model to estimate uh, clouds. We typically still retain shallow convection and uh, we need a PVL parameterization. So I'm going to be operating mostly in this world, but I want you to, to recognize that this is where a lot of folks are doing work now, and when people talk about downscaling, essentially what you're, taking, what you're doing is taking a model output from regional and global models and downscaling it to these local scales. So how do you, you span this gap here? You either do dynamical downscaling or statistical downscaling, or there's now a hybrid downscaling approach that's 
being used. I'll talk briefly about that. So this is a simulation from a convective permitting simulation over North America. Uh, this is four kilometers with the wharf model. The gray are water, is water vapor, and the yellows and, and reds are actually uh, precipitation. And you can see the, the dynamical realism. That was a hurricane that just went by. And if you compare the output and the precipitation and the characteristics of the features that are simulated in this model, this is run with reanalysis. They're very, very realistic. So I've been in charge of a water cycle program since 2001, and one of the, the key areas that we focused on was looking at precipitation intensity, frequency, duration, sequence, and phase in the diurnal cycle. We know that for hydrological modeling, soil moisture, runoff, et cetera, we need to get these, these high resolution aspects of the water cycle right. So we spent a lot of time working on this. And the question we asked ourselves, can we create a convective parameterization that captures this correctly? And the answer that we've come up with is no. We've looked at many different convective parameterizations, and we really are not able to do that. So we're moving to convective permitting simulations. They're expensive, um, but I think they, we can learn a lot about the physics and other aspects of the simulations. Other, op, other um, aspects we're looking at is looking at convective permitting through statistical or hybrid downscaling. Can we capture the benefits, I'm sorry, of convective permitting? So we have a hybrid downscaling system where we actually solve the linear equations of motion in the atmosphere. Uh, so it's not the full dynamical Navier-Stokes equation, but we can get a lot of, about 90% of the benefit over complex terrain just by solving linear flow. So let's look at uh, some output from these, these runs. So I'm going to compare the wharf 36 kilometers with the convective parameterization. So these different colors are cane fresh, Titka, and sass. These are common, common uh, convective parameterizations. There's about 10 or 12 in, in our wharf model repository. And here's the wharf 4 kilometers over the same region here. And if you look at amount, frequency, intensity, this, we talked a lot about this this morning. You can see that all the convective parameterizations are getting it wrong. The observations are this solid red line with the dots. Whereas, as soon as we get to wharf four kilometers, you can see we're getting in mount, frequency, and intensity a lot better. Not quite right yet, but intensity, uh, frequency, and amount um, much better. So we feel that there's a tremendous amount of benefit to be had going to these higher resolutions. What about the diurnal cycle? We did the same thing. Here's the observations for the, the peak in the dur convective diurnal cycle across the United States. And here's the wharf 36 kilometer run with the convective parameterization. You can see it totally gets the diurnal cycle of convection wrong. But at four kilometers, you compare the observations to wharf four kilometers, you can see it does a really good job. So, so again, this is uh, a lot more computer time. We're running on the Yellowstone and uh, Cheyenne supercomputers at NCAR, but we feel like this is really worth it. So what is causing that, that diurnal cycle? That's essentially a midnight maximum in the central US. Well, what happens physically is that uh, Storms, thunderstorms initiate over the Rocky Mountains and they propagate to the east. And these are essentially mesosail convective systems. And this propagation is what causes the midnight max. By the time it gets over Kansas, it's about mi midnight. And what the model is doing at four kilometers is actually capturing the dynamics of this MCS. And that's important because 30 to 70 percent of precipitation over the central US is actually caused by these type of systems. So if you have a climate model you're trying to get precip right, you gotta get these systems right. And this is a movie loop of radar data from Rick Carbone and colleagues showing exactly what I just said. Storms form over the Rocky Mountains and they propagate to the east. 
this is just a repeat, repeating diurnal cycle. So this is the, essentially the breathing of the continent. And you can look at the data and you can see, again, this midnight maximum due to these propagating MCSs. Globally, the same thing happens. Uh, this is the observations, again, the midnight max. This is an old climate model run from NCAR, but you don't see any hint of a midnight max over the continental US. So again, the convective parameterizations are not doing the right thing. Orographic MCSs downstream of mountain ranges is very ubiquitous. This is uh, Arlene Lang and Mike Frisch's work. Um, and you can see, here's the Rocky Mountain. Even into Canada, you can see tremendous numbers of MCSs forming. See in South America, uh, Africa, and Australia, and uh, Asia. So essentially, a current convective parameterizations are doing this. Single column model, very simple. This is what the four kilometer convective permitting is doing. It's actually able to capture, capture many of these effects. So I haven't told you uh, exactly what the simulations were. We ran 13 years over the continental US using this domain. We forced it with era interim on the boundaries here every six hours. Here's the, the microphysical schemes, microphysics and radiation land surface boundary layer schemes we used and we, we did spectral ledging. If you're interested, you can go to this paper by Cheng Hai Liu that describes this in great detail. As uh, Eric, Eric Wood said, it takes a, takes a team to do these kind of work, this kind of work. We have uh, a, a team of about 10 to 15 scientists at NCAR working on this, not full time, but I uh, bring in their expertise as needed. This took about three years to complete. So. So I want to get, move on to evaluation of the convection over the central US. So here's a convective outbreak in May 2010 on the left and the right. One is observations, one is the model. Anybody guess which, which one is which? <laughs> if you watch observations on the left, model on the right. So we can use objective uh, methods to actually track these objects, and we're going to do statistics on them. So here's another test. Uh, the model and observation. One of these is model, one of these is observation. So these are the MCSs across the United States. I've blocked out Canada and the ocean. And these are, um, these tracks fade after about seven days, but this is, these are the these are the tracks of those mesoscale convective systems. So how many vote for the opposite on the right? How many on the left? How many don't care? <laughs> left? <laughs> Looks like opposite on the left. We'll see. Let's see what it is. I don't remember. I never remember what it is. Ah, opposite are on the left, current climate on the right. The, the message is, is it's doing a great job. Um, this, this plot actually blew me away when I saw it. So then. Andreas Prine, who's working in our group, did an evaluation of these MCSs. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, but we use this mode uh, time domain analysis system that's, that you can find on the NCAR RAL website. Randy Bullock developed it. Essentially, it looks at the time and space characteristics from the model and the observations. And then I'm going to look at these five characteristics of the MCSs and see how it compares to the observation sets. So I can do analysis both on the observations and the model. This is the lifetime of the MCS. Red is the model, black is the observations. And you can see the lifetime is done really quite well over this central US region. This is June, July, August. Volume, again, the lines are on top of each other. Maximum precipitation, the model is slightly underestimating the peak. Object speed, this is very impressive. This, the distribution of speeds from the observations and the model are about the same. Uh, size of the MCS, almost identical. And the frequency of MCSs, this is the observations. This is the model. And here, you can see we fail. We failed to get the 
uh, June, July, August uh, frequency of observations. And so we're working on trying to figure that out right now. Uh, the beauty of this, it allows us to actually focus on the key, key aspects of the model that needs improvement. Uh, we look over the central US and we find a warm, dry bias. So we're working on, on evaluating that. We think it's partially uh, due to radiation being too strong and not enough uh, soil moisture. But I'll report on that the, maybe at the next uh, talk. So the future MCS, since we're in Canada, I thought I would just show you. We did a, what we call a pseudo-global warming simulation. You can read about it. Christoph Schar and I have written papers on this where we actually uh, just perturb the reanalysis with future climate from the CMIP-5 GCMs. We did the average over 19 uh, models. And this is the answer for the tracks. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to show you the MCS tracks from the current. And this is the future. And you can see now that we have more MCS tracks. So the frequency of MCSs has increased. You can see the density here. And you can see over Canada, we actually have uh, a lot more MCSs. If we just look at the top 40 extreme MCSs, this is the first figure is the current, and this is in the future. So you can see it's more intense and it's larger. And you can see a plot of precipitation area versus precipitation current, future, more intense, and the volume of precipitation has increased by up to 60%. So I'm almost done, Shrush. Um, if you look at the... Uh, future rain volume or rain rate from these MCSs. You can see the rain rate times the rain area times the speed gives you the volume. So the speed is about the same. Rain areas increase 20 to 70 percent. Rain rate 15 to 40. And the rain volumes up by 30 to 80 percent, almost a factor of two. So this is a significant climate impact. This is, however, with the PGW approach. Uh, we can't afford to run 100 ensemble members, but that's for the next generation of students, I suspect, in the next 10 years. So the question is, is, uh, is it worth it? I think it, it is. You know, going from the simple microphysics and cumulus parameterizations to these resolved physics definitely provides better information. I think it depends on the problem in the region. Um, if you have regions dominated by um, convection, I think you need to think about doing this. However, sometimes you need policy decisions, and in that case, you might want to use an, a hybrid model such as ICAR, Intermediate Complexity Atmospheric Regional Model, um, to do the downscaling choice. Thank you very much. So um, I was at John's uh, InArch workshop in, in uh, Germany a couple weeks ago, and I showed a movie loop of the snowpack in the mountains. And what happens when you have, uh, say, a 36-kilometer model, the mountains are too low and it's warmer, and all the snow and the snowfall and the snowpack melts. So by the time you get to the end of May, and at least in, in Colorado, all the snow is gone. So if you're downscaling based on precipitation or snowpack, there's nothing to downscale from. So at least at these four kilometer resolution, the snow lasts till July, and you still have accurate, uh, accurate amounts. And when you compare it to the snow telt, snowfall, and uh, snowpack, we're within about 10, 10, 15%, which I think is about as, ac as good as you can do to, based on the accuracy of the snow telt data. For the next 40 years, I, I hope we are going to be able to solve the systematic oh. biases, but do you Thank think you we are going question. for... So the, uh, the next work, we are going to continue this work uh, uh, 
Yanping Li and Howard and John have convinced us to cover the entire region of Canada. So we're going to move up, cover the entire region of Canada. We're working on solving the warm, dry bias. And then we're going to repeat the, the simulations for 20 years. Uh, however, this time we're going to run it with the output of a, of a climate model for the weather forcing instead of the reanalysis. So we've, we've been, uh, you know, had some comments from the reviewers saying, hey, we need to look at real climate, climate weather changes. And so we're going to do that. And so we're going to run it for 20 years, and that's going to start probably in a month or so. I'm uh, trying to get my, my uh, scientists to write up the warm, dry bias work. And as soon as that's done, we'll get it going. Thank you, Roy. I thought you would answer that uh, in the next 40 years, you'll probably get the models to resolution of four centimeters or so. And that solves all the problems. We're happy with probably four. Kilometers. Would, it, would be great. Thank you so much.